Hi everyone. Welcome back to Cross Examination. I'm Thomas Cross. I haven't posted a video in a while, and to be honest with you, I was happy in my retirement. That is, until I saw the trailer for this movie. Now, if I've done something to you, just tell me what I've done to you. Well, you didn't do anything to me. I just don't like you no more. You didn't like me yesterday. Something stood out to me. Maybe it was Colin Farrell's impressive tan, or the beautiful sweeping landscapes. Perhaps it was just the unique title. But as the trailer went on, what at first had only caught my eye had now piqued my interest. For starters, I've loved Brendan Gleeson since my all-too-young viewing of the underappreciated 2004 masterpiece, Troy. But what I found truly interesting was the compelling dynamic between seemingly unlikely co-stars. I was instantly taken back to my college years in Boston, where I'd seen a poster in the men's room at the Brattle Street Theater. This poster. All action-y and farcical and pink. I realized it was another movie written and directed by Martin McDonough, his first feature. On a job? Yeah. Here in Bruges? Yeah. Here in Bruges? On a job? Yeah. I had seen Three Billboards when it came out, and I was impressed with it at the time, but never took the initiative to dig into McDonough's other movies, a body of work which I expected to be expansive. But after embarking on a week-long odyssey into his other filmography, I was surprised to find an altogether singular career. Banshees is only McDonough's fourth film. Shocking for someone who's been directing for close to 20 years. In 2006, he won an Academy Award for a short film called Six Shooter, which was, wait for it, his first short. I, I, I mean, that just doesn't happen. So what makes the man who looks like Sting and dresses like the bully at band camp such a remarkable talent? Let's find out. The first thing that stands out to me when watching one of McDonough's films is that they are all profoundly un-PC. If I'd grown up on a farm and was retarded, Bruges might impress me, but I didn't, so it doesn't. He doesn't shy away from the, air quotes, words you aren't supposed to use. You can't say fuck, piss, or cunt, that right? Uh, or anus? And he sometimes even pokes fun at the very notion. I hope your major doesn't kill himself. Your dream sequence will be fucked. He doesn't like being called a midget. He prefers dwarf. Well, this is exactly my point. People go around calling you a midget when you want to be called a dwarf. Of course you're going to blow your head off. Though these instances are sometimes admittedly humorous, that rarely seems to be the point. He uses offensive language as a means to build complex and unique characters that are loaded with plenty to despise, making the narratives all the more engaging when you find yourself rooting for someone you probably wouldn't like to spend much time around. He tends to write about similar topics, whether it's religion, it contained some drops of Jesus Christ, or drinking. Are you kidding me, my booze? One gay beer for my gay friend, one normal beer for me because I am normal. Or suicide, or other stuff. I know I'm a dwarf who sells used cars and has a drinking problem, I know that. But who the hell are you, man? You and most prick. of his characters are well-versed in four-letter words. Number one, why aren't you in when I fucking told you to be in? Number two, why doesn't this hotel have phones with fucking voicemail and not I have to leave messages with a fucking receptionist? Number three, you better fucking be in tomorrow night when I fucking call again or there'll be fucking hell to pay. I'm fucking telling you, Harry. There's a certain absurdity to his work that clashes with the realism you find in most other films that deal with subject matter this heavy. You completely promised to jump in the canal. I don't want to run out there, come back in 10 minutes and find you fucking hiding in a cupboard. I completely promise, Harry. Okay, on the count of one, two, three, go, okay? Okay. What? Who says it? Oh, you say it. You guys are crazy. Hey, ready? Ready. Set? Set. One, two, three, go! In that spirit, it seems like McDonough isn't afraid of the reaction to his films. Okay. Which speaks to one of his greatest strengths. Doesn't make any sense. His willingness to subvert genre. Instead of making a capital A action film, he'll add in entire scenes of levity, which then surprise you with their violent twists. A scene like this on its own might be funny to some, but it becomes all the more effective when it's tied in with a callback to an earlier scene. You came at me with a bottle. What are you gonna do? Shut him down? Someone comes at you with a bottle. That is a deadly weapon, he's gotta take the consequences. He's so reliable with these kinds of setups. 
For another example, early in Seven Psychopaths, when they make a point that Woody Harrelson's gun doesn't always fire, you know it's going to come back around. Now, obviously Martin McDonough is not the only writer to do this. And in fact, almost all good writers are loyal to this practice, at least most of the time. But it's his consistency that I think is one of his greatest strengths. You can watch his films knowing that no moment of screen time is wasted. Even seemingly arbitrary character building conversation is almost always a setup for a later payoff or punchline. Got to stick to your principles. What McDonough is best at though, is using this setup punchline technique to create an expectation and then meaningfully transcending it. For instance, in this scene, you expect Brendan Gleeson's character Ken to climb the tower and shoot, when instead he drops coins and then himself. Which, by the way, even the coins were set up earlier. And here, where our protagonist finally gets the gun, only to find out it's loaded with blanks. Our expectation is challenged. Now we figure the gun is useless without real bullets. Until... Our expectation is again turned on its head. I can't see! Of course you can't fucking see! I just shot a blank in your fucking eyes! This is just proper, entertaining storytelling. And we don't see very many filmmakers operating at this level time and time again. Maybe that's why McDonough has only made four features since 2008. He takes his time and centers his aim so he can hit the bullseye consistently, which is perhaps the crucial element of his peerless filmography. He, along with the imitable Aaron Sorkin, is one of the masters of noticeable dialogue. A, a dialogue that kind of uh, captures the way we really speak uh, through, through its oddness. It, I, I find it hard to explain, but I think if, if we wrote down verbatim everything that we say on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, it would look crazy. It'd look like hi hieroglyphics. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. right. But dialogue alone is hardly enough to become a notable filmmaker. What's much more complicated is pacing and structuring, in which McDonough is a proven talent. He's capable of moments that catch us by surprise, and entire sequences that keep your heart racing. He knows how to start a film with a bang, or two, and how to create moments of deep emotional catharsis in unlikely places. Unless, maybe I go away. I'm struck by the cloak and dagger method in which McDonough effectively uses witty, captivating dialogue to reveal something meaningful about human experience. You find yourself laughing so hard that it can take repeat viewings to appreciate the poignancy. All of my writing kind of comes out that way as kind of darkly uh, comic. Um, and I guess it's the way I sort of see the world. Uh, you, you see the, the, the grimness and, and the darkness and the sadness. But you, if, if you, you can't do anything about it if you let it get you down. So you, you've got to try and find not the humor in those things, but you've got to kind of deal with them with humor, I think. I think for me, that's what makes McDonough's work so powerful. It's dramatic without being manipulative. It's funny without being a joke. It starts with me, oh. Harry. That's an easy one. It stands alone in a time when so many films feel like a rehash of the same old formula. In my research, I found that McDonough had written seven plays before even attempting a short film, signaling that he was a master storyteller with shows featured on Broadway long before he got a nod from the Academy. His success was the product of years of failing. For uh, ages, I was unemployed for like uh, three or five years. What did you do? Uh, write. <laughs> when you write for years and nothing seems to click, it can often feel like you're laboring in obscurity with no hope to ever find success. If McDonough's career is any indication, I'd say the feeling of meaninglessness that people often experience in their early work is not only useful, but perhaps the most important part. It's the struggle that forms you into the creative that can break the mold and fascinate audiences for years to come. McDonough's newest film is poised to be his most affecting work to date, and it borrows its title from the third installment of his Aran Islands trilogy which was notably the only play in the trilogy to never be published or produced. So for Martin McDonough, I guess what they say is true. It all goes somewhere.